Good morning. Good morning, church family. How are we doing this morning? Good. Awesome. Can we go ahead and stand to our feet? We're just going to do a couple things and then we're going to jump into worship. If it is your first time here, I want to welcome you. I should start by saying my name is Leah. It's my honor to welcome you this morning. If it's your first time, we really want to get to know you and connect with you and just plug you into the family. So please stop by the Next Steps table on your way out. There's some beautiful people there that just want to connect with you. Can we say good morning to our online family? If you're online and it's your first time, you can fill out that digital connect card as well. We have a pretty packed room here. We are growing. We have so many new family members. So if you see an open space next to you, could you just scooch in? We want to make room for everyone coming in so they can worship the Lord with us. Let's read together. James 1, 17 says this. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Another version says he doesn't change like the shifting shadows. How amazing is that? That every good thing we have is found in him this morning. If you need joy or peace or hope, it's found in our father this morning. And not only that, he doesn't change like the shifting shadows. He doesn't move around. He doesn't change like our circumstances. He is our rock and solid foundation today. And because of that, we can celebrate this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We come before you as one family. And we are so grateful that every good thing is found in you, God that in your presence we have fullness of joy, Lord. And that because you don't change, God, in a world that's constantly changing, Father, we have a hope for tomorrow, a bright future. God, we come together as a family to worship you. In Jesus' name, we honor you today. Amen. Let's worship together. Amen. Well, let's put our hands together, church.
says is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never before. Oh, Lord, we want your presence, Jesus. Amen, amen. Come on, church, let's turn to the screen as we celebrate someone going public with their faith today. and I've always believed in the Almighty, but I didn't have a spiritual relationship with Him. This was something that was missing in my life, and because of that, I would allow the negativity around me consume me. When we were stationed in Salt Lake City, Utah, we met some amazing people that invited us to their church, and it was there amongst the crowd that I truly felt the presence of God for the first time. In that moment, I felt different. In that moment, my heart was full. After accepting Jesus into my life, I also accepted Him into my home, my marriage, and in everything I do. I try not to dwell on things that I have no control of because, of because I know that God has a plan for me. I have a new vision for life. I have entrusted wholeheartedly in Him and only Him. Today, I am going public with my faith. Cynthia, Jesus said every disciple should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And because of your confession of faith, Today, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And according to scripture, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church, let's celebrate that today. Before we go into this next worship song, uh, just a reminder, just to make room for people coming in, we want everybody to experience God's presence. If there's seats around you, please feel free to scoot or, 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 or move, in, move in front of you just to make room so that we can, uh, we, we can all make room for people that, that are, that are uh, coming in before we go to this next worship song. Come on, let's sing.
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. You do pay our praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. You do pay our praise.
standing in your glory I'll be glad I chose to say One of the things that we can say yes to is a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now this song talks about us, the yes of anything God may ask of us. And once you come into faith with him, there's a working of God with, by the Holy Spirit that brings us to the place uh, of obedience. And it becomes easier to say yes to the Lord. I think probably most of us would be honest and say there's a little bit of rebellion in all of us right yeah there's a little bit of rebellion in all of us not many of us like anybody to tell us what to do okay maybe I'm confessing at communion but <laughs> but but I've learned this when you come to a place where you can trust the Lord God in your life through his son Jesus Christ the yeses to God become a whole lot easier because he's proven what he can do in your life the very fact that my conscience is clear that the guilt is removed because my sins are forgiven by him gives me such more of a, a peace to know I can trust what God is going to do in my life and that begins with a commitment the elements that you hold in your hand reminds us of who this Savior was that came to us. He came, God himself came in human flesh like you and I, lived a life here on earth in total obedience and reverence to the Father, knowing that it was going to end for him in a horrible death, a crucifixion, humiliation, pain, and suffering. But he did that because he wanted us to have the relationship with the Father that he has. And because Jesus Christ has done that and because we believe in what he did for us, we can all say yes to him and have a new life, have our life transformed. And so as we engage in communion or the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist depends on the tra tradition you come from. Once again, you're being reminded I've said yes to him. For some of you, it might be the first time. It might be the first time. You're experiencing something even right now. You can't put your hand on it. You can't put a name on it. But something even right now is saying, I need to say yes to Jesus. I need to say yes to Jesus. And it starts with this time.
of communion. Let us eat together. Let us drink together. Hallelujah. Praise be to our God. Shout hallelujah. Amen, church. We're going to turn to uh, what we call a minute to mingle. Feel free to meet and greet someone around you. There's someone you've never met in the house before. Just let them know you're happy they're here in the house today. All right, yeah, that seems to be working now. Good morning to you. Welcome to Church for the City. We just absolutely are so thrilled that you're here with us, that you joined with us in the house. We uh, desire, our mission actually is to teach uh, God's word, to encounter the presence of the Almighty God, uh, and to share the gospel. And so we're grateful that you are with us and part of what God is doing among us in our uh, city. Uh, there's much for us to, uh, to celebrate. I want to point you to a few things uh, that's happening. We have a group here called Alpha. It's led by uh, uh, one of our elders, him and his wife. And that group's going to be meeting on Thursday night, April 18th. I'm sure the information's on the website also at the Connect table. Alpha is a, a group uh, that will help you to understand some of the basics of Christianity to help you engage with a 
uh, with a small group, but also learn more about who our God is and how that applies uh, to, our, to, to your life. And so I encourage Alpha. We've had great uh, success with it, and people are coming to Jesus as they learn more and more about Christ. It's a great place just to ask questions. Uh, also, our Next Steps Fair will be out on the lawn on the 21st. Uh, Next Steps Fair helps you get connected, find out more about small groups, take the next step if you haven't been in open house, haven't been baptized, need, uh, haven't had a dedication for your child. All of those things are lined out in the Next Steps Fair, and that's on the, on the 21st. You'll notice in front of your chairs there's a tap there. Uh, if you have your phone, you could tap that. It'll open up our church uh, center, get you all access to our app, the sermons, giving. Uh, all things can be done through that, uh, through that tap that's there in front of you. And from time to time when we're doing special things, you'll be able to register for that right there uh, at your seat. I do want to thank you for your generosity. Every time you come into the building, there's, there's ways you can give. There's offering boxes uh, all over uh, the building. Uh, but it's, it's your generosity that allows us to do the work of the Lord in our part of the vineyard. It's also your generosity that helped us to do what we've done on Easter weekend, which was just absolutely amazing. <laughs> amazing, amazing. The, it's certainly well worth it of the cost to do that, record-breaking attendance in all three services. We're just so grateful to God for the number of people that attended, people that was, uh, it was well over 2,200 on Easter Sunday, uh, almost 800 on Friday night, dozens of salvations, just tremendous. You saw a whole, well, you saw two people. No, you only saw one. There's going to be another one, but that, this, this, young lady that got baptized this morning. Her whole family is getting baptized today. Just, uh, just tremendous uh, fruit of what God uh, has done. So we're thankful. We're just so grateful to be, uh, to be able to serve our city uh, in the manner that we do, and that's because of you. So thank you for being uh, part of it. All right, we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to jump into uh, a new series a day, and... Um, and get right on into it. I don't think my message is, is, uh, uh, is very long, but hopefully it'll, it'll hit you hard. It, it's some tough stuff in it. Um, I'm definitely going to overcook your grits this morning, but, but it, you'll be all right. You'll, you'll be fine. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll do that now. I'll go ahead and read. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Now, the series I'm going to go into this morning is five weeks on relationships. I'll define that in just a minute. And then we're going to go back into Romans, starting with chapter 9. But a lot of things that we're going to be pulling in this series is going to be coming out of, uh, out of Romans uh, 12. So I just want to read one verse. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It says, if possible... So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house, to be with your people, to sing the songs that reflect your goodness, songs like gratitude, songs like send me, or that great hymn that we sung after communion. These are songs that reflect your goodness and your love and expression to us. We're delighted to be in the house with people, Lord God, who want to know more about you. And so we're thankful for every gathering that we have in which we can come together in your house and magnify your name. Lord, I pray today that not only there's a great experience here, but for every church in our city, I pray, Lord God, that Christ is exalted. People are gathered together. They're worshiping you. They're magnifying you. And the Lord, that there's a great imprint in our city. Again, I'm so grateful for our city leaders, mayor and council, and uh, those that serve in various capacities. Thankful for their leadership. Thank you, Lord God, for their love for our community. That allows us, Lord God, to serve well in our city for the good of our city. And so we're so we're so thankful. 
We pray, Lord God, that as every church is having an impact, that more and more people will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father God, for those that today, Lord, maybe they're not here because of illness, those that are maybe traveling. Maybe those, Lord God, that are still exploring their faith, not sure where, where the land, not sure what they believe. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll be a healer for those that are sick, that you'll be a, a, a guardian for those that are traveling. And you will be the miner. You will open up the hearts and the minds of those who are still exploring. And I pray, Lord God, for every family that's here. Every family, Lord God, that there will be just a real desire for in our households, in our homes, that there's a greater desire to know more about this God who created us and how we can establish him to be the center of our lives, of our homes. For every business owner, that he will guide his business by the principles of faith, the principles of the Bible. I pray, Father God, that you will help us to know you better as the word of the Lord is preached. And I thank you for the opportunity to do so. May I decrease that you might increase. It's in Christ's name we pray. May the people of God say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I think when you came in, <clears throat> I believe you received an a invite card. Did everybody get one when you came in? And that lets you know what our series is. You can hopefully use that to invite people. But, you know, we've worked through this as a pastoral team and then brought it down to our lead team and talked through some ideas on what we thought we needed to address on relationships and the title of the series is The People You Know Navigating Relationships. And we're, we're going to talk about a marriage. We're going to talk about parenting, family, friends. There's probably other relationships that you have, workplace and church, uh, that we could probably, some of the principles will apply and could have addressed uh, directly. And I know that there's, you know, dynamics and nuances in all of those that could be different. But every relationship that you're in, no matter what it is, it needs to be navigated for it to be healthy. I don't think relationships, I don't think healthy relationships is the same as perfect, uh, but healthy. I, I think you would agree that all relationships, no matter what they are, can have some degree of difficulty. Every relationship can. What we oftentimes overlook is what the common denominator is in all of those relationships. And it's you. It's me. It's people. There are not relationships without people. And wherever there's people, there's a great chance that something is going to go off somewhere. That's just the nature of it. And it's not always that it's, people mean that or it, it's intended, but it's just, it's just challenges. We're, we can be difficult. We can be different. I, 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 I realized something just recently that sometimes when when I'm meeting with people or Virginia and I with, with people and we leave, that sometimes what we say in the vehicle is, you know they're just different. <laughs> it finally hit me that they're probably saying the same thing <laughs> when they leave me. You know, he's, <clears throat> he, why, why, why are too many people, now you know better. My assistant over there nodding her head, about to shake her brains out. As if, you know, why, why is it? Why is it that we think the only people are different are the ones we label as different? When the truth of it is, we all have our nuances. And so if we'll, if, if we'll be honest, there, there, can be, there can be difficult people, and, and I'll address that. 
and a little bit on how to, how to deal with, with uh, difficult people. Uh, but not so much in the sense of where uh, there's no such thing as conflict. I actually believe that oftentimes conflict can be good if it's healthy. It can be good if it's healthy. It can be resolved. There can be resolved to conflict. Unfortunately, uh, we're living in an era and a season and a time where that's just not even where we try to go. If we got issues with people, if we're upset with people, if we see people are different than us, if people don't think the same way as us, we just resolve that there's dissension, there's tension, we're not alike, and it actually escalates even uh, beyond that. Tim Keller said, our culture is becoming littered with enormous numbers of broken and now irreparable relationships. And I think that's the truth. And, and I think we have to ask ourselves, wh why is that? Why, why is it? And I think because when challenges arise and difficulties arise, that oftentimes instead of wanting to work through it for the, for the common good and for the good of that whatever entity that relationship is, we just accept dissension. We just accept dissolution. And I don't believe scripturally that aligns with the will of the Lord. I don't believe it aligns with it. Now, I do know that, that they're just, there will just be some people you just won't have a good relationship with no matter what. No matter who the difficult one is or no matter what the difficulty is. But even in, even in the event of that, there is, you can still surrender to the will of God in, in that. That's why I read that verse, uh, Romans 12, 18. Uh, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The, the New Living says, do all you can to live at peace with everyone. Relationship conflict is taxing. Dissension in relationships is weighty. It can weigh heavy in your heart, heavy on your mind, uh, and in your soul. And so the scripture tells us to do everything we can to live at peace with people. It doesn't mean you're going to see things the same way. It doesn't mean you're going to agree on all things, but you're doing your best to be it. You're not the problem in that relationship. Now, what causes difficulty? I'm just going to give you three things that causes difficulty in every relationship, um, all of them start with S. One of them is sin. Galatians 5, 19 through 22, it says, listen to this, when you follow the desires, now I want you to, when you read this and it says you or your, don't think about anybody else. Think about you, right? When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. When we follow the sinful nature, here's what comes out of that. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Now, we oftentimes, of course, we can define this when we talk about sin, and we'll pull out sexual immorality, and we'll pull out idolatry, and we'll pull out sorcery. But notice, though, what Paul is saying, that because of sin, yes, those things, drunkenness, sexual immorality, idolatry, sorcery, yes, that also, that happens, but so does jealousy. So does hostility. So does quarreling. Paul is basically saying, whenever we have these, these issues, dissension and quarreling and outburst of anger, what has caused that? It would be easy for us to blame others for that, but Paul says it's because of the sin that's in you that causes this. And, and so we can, we can seek out justification on how we on why we respond certain ways that we do, but just know that it's sin that's caused that and the fruit of it will be these things that cause division and dissension. And so, so one of the causes 
of difficult relationships is sin within us. The second one is selfishness, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? Once again, there's nobody's name in here but yours. Nobody's name in here but mine. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. You don't, want, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what gives you pleasure. And so again, we can label this sin also, but he's, he's Paul, uh, sorry, James is just saying selfishness. There's just things that we want, and we get into arguments, and we get in disputes because we want either our way, our point, want to be right, you know, want it to settle in the manner that we want it to settle. And so selfishness also can cause conflict. Sin can, selfishness can. There's no reason to blame anyone else, James is saying. Every one of us that get upset and cause harm to others, whether it be with our words or actions, it's because selfishness has come in and because we want something that we desire. We want our own pleasure. And then the third one is Satan. <clears throat> Satan, 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26. Now, I will say this is in the context of teaching. It's in the context of someone teaching the word to either a person or a group. But there's principles in here that still line up the same. He says, and again I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only starts fight. fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. And so, again, Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, sometimes these difficulties come because people are just trapped. They're in a snare by the devil. Whatever they're thinking, whatever they're believing is either wrong, it's off kilter, it's off center. And they'll stand their ground and they'll argue on wrong principles and wrong beliefs. And he's saying, listen, just be gentle with that. Don't get caught up into that quarrel. Recognize what's happened, that it's probably, it's not any manner of belief or situation that they want to be locked into, but, but they probably are because of whatever they've allowed Satan to do. And so he says biblical character in that even then, dealing with difficult people is to be patient and to be, and to be gentle and not respond in the same manner. Proverbs says a soft answer turns away wrath. And so those are the three things. There's, it, it, there's nothing else that you could even look at biblically that causes difficult relationships. Every relationship that's difficult, it's sin, selfishness, and Satan. That's just uh, the bottom line. It's one of those three expressions. And so what I want to do, give you this, in, this, in this time, is just the cures for it. I'll, I'll get more into the nitty-gritty of relationships when we deal with marriage and friends and family. Uh, we'll get more into the parenting, more in the nitty-gritty. But this is just a general overview, a general scope of what to do if you're in, you're dealing with, living with, working with, serving with, playing with, whatever it may be, with a difficult person. What, what do you do so that this thing doesn't escalate and become worse and, uh, and, and become end up being a dissension or a division. And so let me give you, uh, let me give you these, uh, these five things. The first one is this. Shake off the offense beco before becoming offended. Shake off the offense before becoming offended. I think all of you know offenses will come. Offenses will come from the people who love you the most. People that you're close to can do something or say something that causes you to be offended, causes an offense. 
And you got actually two options there. You can act upon the offense, which will lead you into sin, selfishness, or being caught up in the snare of the devil, or you can just shake it off. Just shake it off. We, we live in an environment now which offenses come so easy. We don't just disagree these days. I mean, it goes from you don't agree what I'm saying, then you hate me. You don't want to line up with what I believe, so I want to cancel you. Don't want to have anything to do with you. I mean, we see it all the time. You don't even have to look on TV. You see it in your family. There's some things you decide that you will not talk about when the family's together because you know it's going to lead to a fight. Am I telling the truth? You just won't even discuss it because you know where it's going to go. Now, I don't think that's healthy, just so you know, but I, I get it because now people, they go from zero to 60. Everything is great. You're sitting down. You're enjoying a meal together, and you mention one person's name who's running for an election, zero to 60. Everything changes. Or you give an opinion or a thought about something. Or maybe you bring up a Bible verse that's biblical, that they ju- it just absolutely flies in the face of what they believe. No, I'm sorry. I love, I love my son. I love my daughter, but I'm not going to go to their gay wedding or to their lesbian wedding. Boom, zero to 60. All of a sudden, you hate them and you hate everybody else. And that's what's wrong with you Christians. You hate people. Am I I, I telling the truth? I mean, that's where we go. And the next thing you know, it's protests. And the next thing you know, it's anger. And and, I mean, we can just go on and on and on. You got to learn how to shake the offense off before you become offended. Now, I'm not saying you won't feel and experience the offense. It could hurt. It could jack up your mind, jack up your emotions. But you you can make a decision, am I going to carry that and let that become a property of my life? That when I'm living, when you see Tyrone Jones, you also see Tyrone Jones carrying offenses. You got to make a decision on what am am I going to do with this? I don't like what they said. They hurt me with what they said. They'll probably never acknowledge what they said or did hurt me. And maybe I don't even know if I even want to try to approach telling them that what they said or did hurt me. I don't even know where I want to go with it. So once you get to that point, you got to choose. Go on with it and let it uh, just make your spirit bitter or just say, I'm shaking this mess off, shaking it off. You, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't carry it further than that. Proverbs 10, 12 says a few things. Hatred stirs up quarrels, but love makes up for all offenses. Proverbs 12, 16, a fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm and insulted. Proverbs 19, 11, you know, it's good to read a proverb a day. It actually is. Whatever the day of the week it is, today is what? The seventh? Read Proverbs 7. Tomorrow, read Proverbs 8. You do that every day, every month. I'm telling you, you'll, you'll, some biblical principles will really become part of your life. Proverbs 19, 11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. So it, 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 it can happen. In, in the best of relationships, it can happen. But, but you, you got to shake that off. That gal got rich singing that song, Shake It Off. What's her name? Uh, what, what's her name? Yeah, that one. She got rich singing it. We ought to get rich doing it. And, 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 and so the other thing, the other thing is, you do come to know this. You, you don't know necessarily when, when you run into somebody that maybe it's a difficult moment, you don't know what just happened before they saw you. You don't know what was happening. You don't know what was going on. When people jet in front of you and drive like maniacs on the road, maybe they just got a call that their kid was rushed from school to the hospital. Who, who knows? Just don't let sin and selfishness 
and Satan get in there and cause what was an offense, legitimate. You don't deny that it was. You just don't let that be something you carry. Y'all doing all right? The second thing is to pray for them. Now, we know to do this. We, we know to do this for people anyway. We certainly know to do it when we're dealing with difficult people or difficult situations. Sometimes I, sometimes I ask the Lord to give me a scripture to help me, you know, when I'm dealing with something difficult or someone difficult. It's unfortunate that sometimes a verse that comes in my head is Psalm 3-7 where it says, Arise, O Lord, rescue me, slap my enemies in the face and shatter, them and shatter their teeth for their wickedness. Sometimes I got to fight off certain scriptures that come to mind when I'm asking God for a scripture that I'm just confessing. You got to fight those things off. Certain scriptures that come to mind, you know. Lord, you, you know what they've done to me. Give them hemorrhoids. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let them work through the hemorrhoids. God bless them with bees, bees on these, all of them, you know. <laughs> Plague of flies in their house. Um, that's not the way to go. I'm just saying. <laughs> that's just the stuff sometimes you got you to gotta work through, right? Uh, and and it, is, it is true that most of those precatory prayer and precatory prayers of David, they start off rough, but they usually do end asking God for his blessing and goodness upon those. Psalm 5, 43 through 44 says, You've heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so we pray. We pray for them in all sincerity, asking God to do good for them, do good in them, whatever that case may be, to pray for them. So we shake off the offense, we pray for them, but we also bless them. You know, the word bless in the Scripture, I guess it's used in a, in a few different ways, but um, primarily in the New Testament, it has the meaning of speak well of. Um, the, the, the base of the word is where we get the English word eulogy. And so usually when somebody is eulogizing someone at a funeral, you're believing that they're going to go up there and speak well of them. No matter what they know about the rascal, they're going to, it's the time to do the eulogy. So go speak well of them. And blessing means just that speaking well uh, of people. Speaking well of doesn't mean that you don't know some real reality about some difficulties, some situations, some matters of things that they've done to you. But you can speak well of or don't, don't speak at all. I, I, certainly, I certainly don't understand why when we have situations with people, we want to post it on social media. I don't know why we, I don't know why we do that. I, I don't know why we want to go and gossip about people that we've had difficulties with when the Scripture clearly tells you not to. The Bible tells you not to. But then you'll, you know, you'll go and start pasting on social media about somebody did this and some politician did that and some local business and how the service was and some political group, and then people had a nerve to tell me, well, the only reason I do that is because I don't want what happened to me to happen to them. Stop lying. I throw a penalty flag on that. That's no, mm -mm. no, 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 no. 15-yard penalty. You out of line. No. It's not your job to protect other people. Hello? It's, 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 it's not your job to be the, the one that spreads bad stuff about other folks because you want to protect other folks, be the one to be, be a blessing. If you got bad service at the restaurant, you don't have to tell nobody, just don't go back. You ain't got to sp spread it all around. Somebody done you wrong, you ain't got to, you know, you ain't got to, oh, just pray for me, so-and-so done this, and I'm just asking for prayer, I'm not trying to gossip. Yes, you are. You are gossiping. You are gossiping. Don't, don't, 
Don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Not only is it not good, it's just not biblical. And I think that's where if none of the words that I suggest to you work, then fine. Just let's go by what the Bible says. How about that one? Luke 6, 27 and 28 says, love your enemies. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. That's still in the Bible. Even in 2024, it's still in the Bible. For some reason, in some manner, the liberals haven't been able to take that and just rip it out of the Bible. Shouldn't say the liberals. <laughs> Love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Still in the Bible, 1 Peter 3, 9, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. You want to make your day? Do something good for somebody who jacks you up. It takes a lot to do it. It takes a lot. It takes absolutely turning to the Lord and asking God, help me to do what you would want me to do in this case. And I guarantee you the Holy Spirit is the same all the time. The Holy Spirit will never say, you know what, usually I would say bless them, but no, no, not this time, man. Throw a rock at their car and break windows. No. Holy Spirit will always be the same. Holy Spirit will always be the same. Give them a blessing back. The Scripture says that's what God called you to do, and he will grant you a blessing. That leads to the fourth thing, to do something good to them or for them. It's an interesting, this passage in Romans, especially verse 21, it's actually interesting. And I, well, I'll read it first. It says, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that, leave that to the righteous anger of God. I, I, we, and we will. When we get to Romans 12, we'll talk about that because that's a real defining line that the Lord is, is given us that we don't take revenge because God will do what is right. He'll do what is right. For the scriptures say, and, and can I just say this? First of all, we don't know what right may be. Sometimes we think when God takes revenge for us, we think God's going to get them. That may not be what is right. Sometimes God has a way of working with evil people and does something good to them. Remember the scripture says, it's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance. And so we don't even wanna just sit around and wait for God to do something to him and say, see, I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming because of what you did to me. No, no, no. Let God do right and we don't rejoice in somebody's mishap. Y'all doing all right? Only got, you only gotta hang on for eight minutes and 30 more seconds says, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. I, I, I don't know exactly, I know that Paul is referring to a Proverbs, in Proverbs 25, this same language about burning... Uh, heaping burning coals on their head. I don't actually know what, what that means. I don't know the context of it. I've done as much research as I could. It just simply, I guess the only simple thing I can take out of it is when you do good to people when they've done you wrong, it brings a shame to them. It brings a shame to them. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness can never drive out darkness. Only light can do that. He said, hate can never drive out hate. Only love can do that. And so when people have done you wrong, you, you got to let go of the receipt. You can't hold on to the receipt to say, no, I'm going to get you back or something's coming to you because of what you've done. You can't hold on to that receipt. You got you to gotta let it go. Give it to the Lord and watch him do justice and righteousness. And you keep your heart and mind clear. Here's the last thing. Team, you can come. Uh, we'll wrap this up. The last thing, obviously, I think you knew this was coming, was to forgive them. You, you had to know that was coming, right? You could have wrote them into this message. 
with everything that I've talked about with difficult people. I could have started out with forgiving them, but I wanted to keep in suspense. <laughs> the bottom line is, is, is to forgive them. Luke 23, 34 said, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Of course, that's, that's the ultimate case of forgiveness when we see Christ and how he indeed responded to people who just would not accept truth, who was, who was hell-bent on crucifying him. And those were the words of Jesus on the cross. Now, forgiving does not minimize the situation, as you well know, nor does forgiveness mean reconciling. It's, it's, it's not holding the person responsible for what has happened to you, you're releasing them. When I say responsible, of course, you, you, you name what they've done, you know what they've done, but you're not the one that has the receipt to do something about it. It doesn't mean, again, minimizing it. It doesn't mean reconciling it. They're going to be responsible, but they're going to be responsible to God. And believe me, I, I get it. I, I am the main guy standing up here that tells you I like to see justice with my own eyes. I'm going to be flat out honest. I want to see justice with my own eyes. But I know at the end of the day, God is the just one. And he's always going to do what's right. And if I can't see it, if you don't feel vindicated, if the person never acknowledges that they're wrong, you can absolutely be sure that God will do what is right if you do what is right. I'm telling you, sometimes we, we let people live rent-free in our heart and our head. They don't pay no rent, but they consume all of your thoughts. They don't pay no rent, and they consume everything going on in your heart. You can't even make life decisions, right decisions, because somebody's living rent-free in your head and in your heart. We got to let them go and we got to forgive them. Colossians 3.13 says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who f offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And I think that's probably the bingo of this sermon. I, I, that's actually where we'll land because the only thing actually that makes all of these things possible that I just talked about you know, shaking off the offense, praying for them, blessing them, doing good to them, forgiving them. The only thing that makes that possible is that you realize and recognize that God has forgiven you. If, if you don't realize that, recognize that, and embrace that, you're not going to be able to bless others. You're not going to be able to pray for them. You're not going to forgive them. It's when you experience it and realize everything that Christ has forgiven of you, which I'm going to tell you, the offenses that you have done against God way outweigh what anybody has ever done to you. It's not even close if there was a measuring stick. It's not even close. But because we recognize that Christ has forgiven us, forgiven people forgive. And the greater you realize your forgiveness is for, from Christ, the easier it is for you to forgive. It's understanding what he's done for us. Let's just be honest. I had to, <laughs> when I was meeting with our team this morning, I told them I was going to be preaching on difficult people. And I told them it's a little hard to stand up here and preach on difficult people when I know I'm one. And they all laughed and shook their head. <laughs> so I'm just as different. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm feeling the love right now. So it's just, it's, 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 it's just as difficult uh, to forgive people when people have done things to you, when you know what they've done and what they want to acknowledge. But then when you think about 
what the Lord has forgiven us for. And when we have a relationship with our, with our God and Father, we don't get any bitterness from Him. We don't get any rage from Him. We don't get anger from Him. We don't get harsh words from Him. We don't get slander from Him. All we get is the forgiveness that came through Christ. So Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says this, get rid of all bitterness against someone, about a situation, rage, anger, harsh words, shake it off, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior, just stop responding. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. All right, that's good enough. Everybody stand if you would. Prayer team, you can come. I'm going to pray for a few things here. And... Um, I'm looking forward to next week. We're going to deal with, with marriage. It's the first time, actually, since Lady V and I have been married that I'm actually going to teach on marriage, and I'm so excited about it. And so I want to, I want to, I want to pray now. If, if I can just get you to bow your heads and just close your eyes for just a moment, I'm just going to ask for... Let's just, just be okay and be honest. If, if you know that some of the manners that you have responded to people, it can be people that you're close to, maybe someone you're married to, maybe your children, maybe someone on the workplace. But you realize that the way that I've been responding is because of sin or selfishness, or just caught up in what the devil wants me to do. And you want to repent of that. Can I just ask you to raise your hand? I'll just pray for you right where you are. God bless you. Thank you for being honest. This is what I know. God is faithful. By your acknowledgement, I've, I've been acting wrong. I've been acting out. I've been behaving wrong. It's not leading to any good. I'm carrying this offense, carrying my anger, carrying this bitterness, letting this stuff just have free rein in my head and heart, and I just, I want that to stop. I want it to stop. Father, you see the hands all over this building. These are people, Lord God, that are being honest. They may not have had a chance to be honest with anyone before, and maybe still have a little bit of trepidation of being honest with someone about what's going on in their mind and their heart and what they're saying and how they're reacting. But Lord, right now they want to be honest with you. They want to be honest with you. So Lord, I pray that you see every hand, you look into every mind and you look into every heart. And Lord, as you have forgiven them for their sin, so shall you forgive them for their actions, their behavior, and the things that they said. Let today be a day of freedom for them, a day of freedom. And let today be a day where they start anew with whoever it is, with whatever happened, let them start anew. Doesn't mean that they're reconciling with the situation or the person, but in their hearts and their minds, they're releasing it to you. They're releasing it to you. They don't want to become part of the difficulty in any relationship. As a matter of fact, they want to express the love of Christ like you've given them. And Father, I thank you, not only just for them, but for all of us. I, I know how the devil works. Today will be a day for somebody to have a difficult situation with somebody. Holy Spirit, right now, step in. Remind them of the word that they heard this morning. Remind them, Lord God, of their desire to do the right thing even in that situation and let it be done. Let them lay their head down tonight and say, glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. Let us walk in forgiveness of others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you.
If you feel like you want to join a life group, and let me just say, if you're not in a life group, please, life group, please get plugged in. This is community throughout the week. It's so important that we have that. If you want to go to open house, if you want to serve on a team, please stop by the table in the lobby, the Next Steps table, and they will help you get plugged into the family. We hope you have a wonderful week. We love you so much. Have a good day.